Bulger. I'm the co-founder of the Enterprise Engagement Alliance, which is an organization dedicated to the uh, promotion of people-centric management. And I'm very happy today to host a program on employee engagement uh, best practices uh, with four experts uh, bringing perspectives from the whole gamut. Uh, that's starting with Dr. Salon Shiraz. She is a founder of HC Moneyball, which is a leading uh, uh, analytics company in the human, ca human capital analytics space, and they have a new SaaS software for benchmarking. And she's also an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California, Columbia University, and New York University on human capital management. And she's held senior HR positions for multiple big companies. Uh, we also have today, uh, uh, that would be Al Sini. He's founder of BCAT Brand Alignment. They are a leader of uh, solutions to help companies align all of their people around uh, their brand. And the brand is defined as that organization, what it looks like on its best possible day. And he'll be telling us a little bit about that. Uh, Barb um, Hendrickson, she is uh, an entrepreneur uh, who ran a very successful uh, incentive uh, marketing company in the Detroit area with leading accounts. And she is also co-author of the only formal certification program that I know of in Sincentive Program Design, uh, which is a very comprehensive uh, system uh, program design that I don't think enough companies are using. And finally, we have Peter Goldberger. He is a co-principal of the Incentive Team, and they're a specialist in sales engagement. And uh, you might wonder why we don't have any active HR people on this call or active sales managers. Well, as we're gonna find out, the reason is, is that most programs are not measured. Most programs do not have a proper ROI. And so we have on the phone four people who are at the front lines of this and who don't have anything to hide and who can speak candidly about not only what we're doing wrong, but most importantly, what simple things can we do to improve employee engagement? So Solange, I'm gonna start with you uh, with this question. Um, over the many, many years um, that you've been involved with business, how many companies do you think have a strategic and systematic approach to managing human capital and really looking carefully at the ROI of their HR processes like engagement incentive programs and whatnot and how they line up to the organizational goals? Um, Bruce, thanks for including me in this great program with these great people on the panel. Um, I, I appreciate being here. Um, to answer your question, I don't think that there are very many companies at all that are actually looking at uh, human capital performance as it relates or at, as a driver of enterprise level performance. Um, lots of attention has been given in the last 20 years or so to um, things like balanced scorecard approaches. Um, but human resources typically looks at human resources programs against their own KPIs without really understanding the impact that those programs have on enterprise level performance. And that's the big missing link. Um, when human capital costs are anywhere between, I don't know, 30 to 80 percent of total corporate operating expense. Um, human capital performance is really significant in terms of driving your profitability performance and HR people are not looking at that and financial people, CFOs, are just beginning to think about that relationship between the return on investment in human capital and corporate financial performance. And there's a whole industry that's, um, that's developing around it in terms of these kinds of metrics. So in a sense, uh, Solange, uh, many CEOs are driving with one eye on the road. They are basically, one eye is not capturing a lot of value creation. Al, not only, of course, do you have an advisory firm in brand culture alignment, but you are also in management uh, in broadcasting in New York. And in fact, your methodology, as I understand it, developed out of building teams on the fly and how to get a consensus around a, a common vision. To what extent do you think organizations are really looking strategically and systematically at people management? And we are going to be talking um, shortly about some very big trends that could push it along. But where do you think the status is right now, Al, so far? 
I, I think uh, organizations are trying to respond to growing mandate calls for them to, uh, to uh, focus more on their people. But I don't really think that they have a, a lot of the, a lot of the strategy, uh, Bruce, I think gets lost in the silos that manage the different aspects of this. So um, what we like to think is that HR and marketing and sales are really three kind of different paths up to the top of the same mountain. And the top of the mountain is what people are really supposed to be engaged in, and that's corporate purpose. And I don't think organizations spend very much time at all really articulating the change that they intend to make in the world. And that's really what gets, I think, especially these days, that's what gets, that's what gets employees uh, engaged and excited. Uh, so, Barb, uh, you worked with many, many major companies over the years, um, and uh, I think you've even won awards for some of the programs that, that you've designed over the years. How and, and a lot of your work has been done in the promotional work in the sales area, where you would expect to be there be a fair amount of measurement. In fact, how many people do you think really apply rigorous ROI uh, tools to their incentive and recognition programs? Um, not very many. And of course, that's always been the struggle because companies tend to, their company leaders tend to think, you know, uh, and I can speak to the role that incentive programs play uh, toward employee engagement. And they're, they've been considered touchy feely and they're nice to have, but you have to measure if you're going to make the, the case to management that these are actual revenue producers and not overhead. So, um, and of course, the most effective incentive programs are aligned with company goals and the, you know, people pay attention to what's measured. It's a way for executives to communicate what's important to them. But if you don't measure at the end, I, I don't know how you prove anything. Uh, there's a recent uh, IRF trend study that said, I'm not even sure I believe this statistic. They said, <clears throat> excuse me, that 44% are conducting program analysis that's actually up from 25% in 2019. So there's still a huge opportunity for companies to, uh, or for practitioners to help companies uh, use that data for business growth. So Barb, that's the Incentive Research Foundation, just for those of you folks yeah, who I'm don't sorry. know. I'm sorry, I used that uh, abbreviation. Well, no worries, yep. but that study, which I often saw when you read between the lines or not between the lines, when you dig down, they're measuring it, but you know what they're measuring? They're measuring it for participant satisfaction. Yeah, That's measuring it. the wrong things. Measuring the wrong <laughs> yeah. things. Now, Peter, we brought you in uh, particularly because of your expertise in sales engagement, and you've been doing this, and I met Peter, I met you kind of years ago, so I know that your business, you didn't even come out of the quote incentive world. If I recall, your background was more training. And you would think that the sales engagement area would be the most measurable uh, area and that uh, the bean counters would really be looking at the ROI of sales engagement. But in fact, Peter, what has been your experience on the seriousness of measurement and sales engagement? Well, well, you're right. When we look at all the performance improvement programs that are out there, you would think sales is the easiest. We have a baseline. We know exactly what it was prior to the program but you would be shocked and absolutely disappointed in the number of companies that I've met with that have never really looked at the ROI of the program. It's the easiest one. The data is there. These aren't soft numbers. These are hard numbers. Yet more and more companies I see, they, they just have not caught up to, wow, what is the ROI of all of these dollars that we're investing in these types of programs? It's shocking. And what's really interesting about it no company would think about making a major investment in technology or in a plant or in a building without running basic ROI analyses. They wouldn't even think about it. Uh, and yet they're willing to spend, as uh, Solange said, 30 to 60% of their annual expenses on people. And when you talk to CEOs and you talk to CFOs and you ask them about that, you know what they say? Oh, it can't be measured you know what, uh, I know it works. You know, I know half of it works. I just don't know which half. If I took it all away right now, everyone would be upset. Um, so whatever. And, and, then, and, and then often, you know, behind closed doors, they'll tell you that the sales managers and HR people are always coming up with these schemes. And, you know, they don't know whether they're going to work, but whatever. Um, 
But something is going to change now, I think. And I'm going to ask you my next question before we get into sort of, because we promised in this half hour, we're going to give concrete tips on how to change this reality that most programs are not measured and, and be, and we'll discuss that. But two big things have happened, and I want to get the, the impression from you folks as to what you think about that. We've just talked about the fact that most of this isn't measured. Companies don't have a clear human capital strategy, but the light bulbs are beginning to go off because there are more and more analytics over the last couple of years that have told us that, gee, people are a factor. We've got to begin to pay attention to that. But two things happen. Uh, and I want to get your reactions to that. First, the Securities and Exchange Commission of the United States uh, just issued a new regulation. It's now probably effective now, and it's certainly going to be effective for the 2021 proxy season for every public company. Um, they now have to disclose to the extent that is material to their business operations, those human capital practices uh, and metrics that they use to track their, uh, their recruitment, retention, and development of employees to the extent that it's material to their business and in a way that can be compared from year to year. So, and we also know now that 70% of investors today are very focused on how companies treat people. And we know that the so-called ESG uh, investor category, that's environmental, social, and governance, is by far the fastest growing element of investing today. And most of the ESG funds, four out of six, are outperforming the S&P 500 this year, despite a very volatile year. Now, if that weren't enough news um, uh, to get CEOs thinking, because of course, as soon as an SK is uh, reformed, what happens? All the big lawyers start sending out reports. Mm -hmm. And already the major reports, one of them says from one of the top law firms, what to do now that human capital disclosures are the law, are the law. That's their words, not mine. Um, now, secondly, uh, if that weren't enough, a very prestigious organization, the World Economic Forum, it has, an, that's well known for the Davos uh, event. Uh, they developed, um, and they just re uh, introduced it two weeks ago, uh, a new white paper called Stakeholder Capitalism Metrics. And these are new metrics that they are recommending uh, that all companies use, not just public companies, all companies that they should use to publish corporate responsibility reports that are a clear way to compare one company to another in their environmental, social, and governance practices. And there are multiple metrics related to the social or people metrics related to retention, development, i.e. all of the information being requested by the SEC. Now, I think it's fair to say in parochial terms that the uh, World Economic Forum is the in crowd of business. These are truly the biggest leaders in business. The Bank of America's CEO, Brian Moynihan, he actually announced these new standards and he said that every company on earth is going to have to do this because it's the only way to compete. And even some days your bank loans are going to be based on the way you treat people. So with those, I would think those are rather extraordinary developments that might change the conversation. But Solange, you've been uh, in business for uh, a few years. What do you think? Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I like the way that you're characterizing it, um, but it actually isn't a new trend. So even though the SEC announced their um, you know, new reporting requirements in Form 101C related to the, the material impact of human capital performance in organizations. Um, other organizations have been calling for this for years. Um, so it's not a new thing. It's just gotten the attention of the SEC. Um, and it feels a little bit like, um, you know, a tsunami. It's been this growing wave of both regulators, um, governance rating agencies, um, the SEC, and investors, because the the movement from the SEC actually came from the IAC, from the um, investor, um, what's that? From the Human Standard. Capital Management Coalition. Um, right, and the Human Ma Capital Management Coalition who sort of started this whole ball rolling. But organizations, governance monitoring organizations like the IIRC, um, GRI, ISS, SASB, um, they've all been calling for more transparency. and. When we think about transparency, we have to talk about ISO, the International Standards Organization, who um, <laughs> released a new standard January of 2019 called uh, number 30-414, 
which calls for the disclosure of human capital performance to both external um, constituents and internal constituents. So their fundamental premise is organizations that are transparent in the way that they communicate their performance, especially around human capital, are actually performing better than those organizations who are shrouded in secrecy and maybe not even, um, you know, uh, uh, shrouded in secrecy because that's a strategy, just because they're not paying attention and they're not seeing that this is a, a lever, a driver of higher levels of performance. Um, I had a conversation the other day with somebody from uh, one of the four, the big four accounting firms on this concept of materiality. How do we define what it is? How do we identify which aspect of human capital is actually material? And that's a little bit of a slippery slope. You'll see that no one's actually discussing how do we define materiality because materiality is a standard. Um, and so we have to actually look at it contextually. But one of the things that he, he observed is if we can prove the relationship between human capital per management performance and corporate performance, we don't really care about disclosure. Any smart business person is going to say, I'm going to understand this because it's going to help me run my business better, not I'm going to understand this because I have a disclosure requirement, right? It's a little bit like the cart before the horse. Um, and what we're doing now in the human capital area, especially the analytics area, is connecting those dots. What is driving corporate financial performance? And we've got some great metrics that help us understand at the macro level, at the aggregate level, whether or not organizations are actually seeing a return on their investment in human capital and human capital programs. And I don't know if you want me to address that now or you want to wait well, until we'll get a little to that later. Bit, okay. Um, but so there, there's, a, there's a business rationale. There's a business imperative. It goes beyond the disclosure part of it. In fact, that's, it's almost irrelevant, the disclosures, as you say. If you're not going to, in fact, the video that announced the new stakeholder capitalism metrics, um, the, the speakers like Brian Moynihan, they say, these metrics mean nothing unless you manage your business to them. Barb, you um, have been involved with industry outreach efforts um, for years. Um, it, in a past life, uh, I think you were involved in multiple committees um, that were trying to get companies to understand the importance of people. There was even a lobbying group to get tax laws to promote productivity and quality. And in fact, they were successful. Those laws are still, uh, they were removed from the books. But for many years, there was an incentive, a tax incentive for companies to run engagement programs to promote safety that got wiped out in the last big tax reform. But Barb, what do you think the forefathers of the industry that you were in would have thought to see th these major organizations proclaiming that people are now material to success? Am I nuts or is this rather revolutionary? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> they would be thinking, okay, finally, finally, somebody cares. Because, I mean, the, the purpose of, part of the purpose of incentive programs or at least employee incentive recognition and reward programs are, are Formed from the concept of, you know, we treat our employees well, they'll treat our customers well, and, you know, it's not necessary to have a customer-centric, you know, uh, focus if you start by treating the employees well and communicating what's important to the company and what our values are and then rewarding that kind of behavior. So I think um, any of the, the founding you know, organizations that have been pushing for this forever would be thrilled with any kind, I mean, there was Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, in the, in the past that anything that encourages companies to measure and to, to actually prove the benefits of these programs is thrilling. Finally, we're going to get back to Sarbanes a little bit with Solange because that when we get back to that, because again, it's our company's just going to check off the box or are they going to take this seriously? And obviously they're going to take it seriously if it's a link to their financial results. So we'll get back to that with you, Solange. Al, uh, you've been really at the forefront. One of the reasons I invited you on this is that you know, I've been following you on LinkedIn for quite a while and you've really been pushing this sort of strategic approach to people uh, ever since I've known you um, and you 
what do you think? Do you think that this, uh, that the big boys or big ladies out there saying that you got to really do this is going to help draw attention to it? Or is it just going to create more of a check off the box, men a box mentality? Well, there, there will definitely will be a check off the box mentality. There's no question about that because people are going to feel like they need to fill a role that satisfies other people. They always do that. But when I've worked for an awful lot of companies that have got terabytes of HRIS, HR, human capital data, terabytes of it. When you peer through all that and you try to find the wisdom in the middle of all that data, what you find, and this is so fundamental, I'm surprised people don't realize it more. The reason why people want to work for your company and the reason why people want to buy for your, from your company are the same reason. They want to work for you and they want to buy from you because they believe that will make them better versions of themselves. So the trick for any corporation is to take all that data and boil it down underneath a compelling message about purpose that clearly articulates the change they intend to make in the world in their company. That is what you rally people around. And Peter, that's a good segue to you. Again, I know you have experience in employee programs as well, but I, I wanted you on from the sales management perspective. You know, direct, you know, pe salespeople are people too, right? So I've heard some people, human capital is separate from salespeople. No. In fact, great organizations are, in my view, and I'm, I, I'm proud, I'm a salesperson, I may own my company, but I love to sell, because selling is helping people. Right. And if, when you sell properly, you're only selling to people that can be helped by what you do. So, Peter, from your standpoint, do you think that people coming down on high from the on high and saying we have to start measuring, we have to have metrics. Do you think that's going to rub off in sales or do you think sales managers are going to continue to do everything they can and to avoid getting me measured so that they can do those sales trips to Barbados when people start traveling again? It's funny. I, I think the good ones have already actually started it. They're really looking at rewarding behaviors that drive better sales. So what are those behaviors? What are those four or five things a salesperson can do to be successful? And they're focusing on those four or five things. Back a couple of decades ago, it was all about, well, how many units has someone sold? And okay, great, they're gonna get the latest TV or trip as you mentioned or whatever it might be. But today there are a lot, the good companies, there are a lot of them who really are focused on what are those behaviors? What are those KPIs? And then let's build that program around those behaviors. And uh, that is still very rare. And by the way, that is the fundamental in Barb's uh, uh, curriculum. One of the fundamental elements is a balanced scorecard um, where you don't just measure the result. You measure the behaviors which lead to results. Because if you only measure results, you're going to generally reward the top 20% anyway who would have performed without the incentive. And more than that, you're going to promote Wells Fargo type of behavior oftentimes where people are just focused on signing up accounts and there's no, no, other, counter men, no other measure to detect that behavior. So um, we're going to focus now, really get into the meat of this show here and to give you some really good advice. And so I'm going to ask each one of these uh, experts here to share their best advice. Uh, related to the design and the elements of, uh, of getting effective results from any type of employee engagement, whether it's sales or non-sales. But with that, I'm going to start with one other interesting statistic. So Solange, you're all, everyone here on this call is aware of the fact that Gallup has been conducting surveys of employees and their levels of engagement for the last 10 years. And essentially, over the last 10 years, there has been no improvement none. They're, and it, in fact, I think it's a little lower than it was 10 years ago. Uh, and then secondly, the, another group called the American Customer Satisfaction Association does annual surveys of the level of satisfaction in brands. That hasn't improved. In 10, 20 years, only 73% of people say they're generally satisfied with the customer service that they get from brands. So we're not doing very well on employee engagement and we're not doing a great job on customer engagement. Solange, why do you, is this tied to the lack of measurement, the lack of serious discipline? And if so, what is advice that you give to companies to start the process of turning that around? Oh, such a big question. Um, <laughs> so let me back up a little bit. So earlier in the program, we basically created a narrative arc why it's important to understand human capital performance, because it actually is a fundamental driver of economic value creation in organizations. And because companies spend so much money on 
HR and HR programs and people that it's really leverageable. Small improvements in a big expense generate big improvements in profitability. So we've got that narrative arc that this is an area that you should be looking at. When you talk about employee engagement, there are lots of different ways to measure that. You can go to the employees and you can say, are you happy, are you engaged? That's kind of disruptive. Um, as an HR analytics person, I actually like to look at the outcomes of employee engagement. If you've got engaged employees, they're productive. They stay with you. They go above and beyond. Um, they um, mentor and train other people. They participate in training. Um, so there are measurable indicators of employee engagement without necessarily having to go to the employee and ask them are you engaged, are, are you happy? Um, if you look at the academic literature, the probably the strongest driver of employee engagement is something called organizational justice. Do employees feel that they are being treated fairly by their companies? Not only by the way the companies are structuring programs like sales incentive programs or other incentive programs, but all rewards programs, all training programs. Um, and are they, do they believe that they are getting a fair distribution of value? Are they getting paid the right things? Um, organizations that have high levels of employee, perceived employee organizational justice, where employees feel, feel that they're being treated fairly, actually see a correlation to high levels of employee productivity. The more productive your employees are, the more return you're going to get on that investment in people, and the higher your HCROI, the human capital return on investment is, that's tied directly to profitability. So we don't have to guess what's driving profitability. We can see that through the employee um, performance, the employee contribution. And um, Barb was saying something really interesting about shifting from um, customer centric to employee centric. We're seeing that. And it's the new, it's the next evolution in the business model. You need to be employee centric. You need to understand your employees. You need to figure out how to make them stay with you longer, how to be more productive. Um, and if you can do that, you can crack the nut because as you said, Bruce, if you have happy employees, you're gonna have happy customers. Um, so that's the trend that we're moving in. And there are lots of ways to measure that without actually disrupting the organization and understanding the correlation between these metrics and corporate financial performance so you can begin to prioritize. You don't have to guess anymore. And but that's the key thing, Solange, uh, uh, to sum up uh, her point, um, that it, you have to start by having human capital metrics for your organization. And each organization has to figure out what are the metrics that are relevant to them, but some very five basic standards, and this is from Solange, would be human capital ROI, and there's a pretty simple calculation for that. Uh, human capital value add, that's the extent to which your employees are actually contributing to your bottom line. And then their basic productivity uh, and quality uh, measures, revenue costs and willingness to recommend per employee, per customer, and then diversity, uh, equity, uh, diversity and equ inclusion, equity. It's not just enough to have a diverse uh, community, but to have one that is equitable. And then finally, training effectiveness. And that's really from Solange's recommendations. But just to, in other words, you've got to start with a dashboard and yeah. then you can begin to see how effective your approaches are. And Al, I'm going to move to you on this one because the, everything, when you really look at stakeholder capitalism and you look at that video that the World Economic Forum produced, the, it all starts with purpose. It all starts, the only way you can get alignment between all your stakeholders, your customers, your employees, your shareholders, your communities, is to have a sense of purpose. And Al, since you're, what you do is all about, in a sense, instilling purpose, uh, what are the things that you think companies can do to get that fundamental, uh, build that purpose into their day-to-day -day organization and into their brand? When we, when we uh, thank you, Bruce, and you know, you and I have talked about this quite a bit over the last year. But, uh... When you talk about purpose inside of a company, what you're really talking about is the alignment point that it forms the intersection between what they sell and their value proposition, their employee brand, for the, what they promise to their people. So brand and culture alignment is about taking the entire purpose of the organization and its outside voice and its inside voice and aligning them with a North Star that represents the goals of the company. 
Now, for a lot of people, that's a kind of a soft, vacuous, vague thing that they don't know quite how to approach. Simon Sinek says we have to find our why. Maya Angelou told us that we have to be the change we want to see in the world. They were both right. Problem is, how do you do that? And we've come up with a way. If you think about your whole organization, and this could be a two-person company or a 40,000-person multinational. If you think about your whole organization as though it were a single person walking the world, making a change, doing its best work when it's best day, what would that person be like? Get people to think deeply about that. In an organization that's struggling, you get different answers from everybody. Everybody pretty much sees themselves. In an organization that's really aligned, that's actually clicking, those answers converge. They become closer together. People visualize the same person when they work for a company that's aligned. And that is measurable. All of that, we, we developed an instrument for that. We have a methodology for that. And you can pre and post test on doing something, by the way, we talk about employee happiness. What we've learned in our work is that productive employees are happy. It's not the other way around. And uh, people, people feel they're productive when they're serving a mission that's bigger than themselves. And what you need to do is articulate that for them. And it's and not- And you know, Al, there's a lot of basis for that uh, in the last couple of years in marketing. There's a big trend in Barb being a content marketing specialist. That's what her company does today. Uh, it's all about personas, right? And a it company- is has a persona uh, and we're not a political organization but poor Mitt Romney when he said companies are people he got ripped to shreds and yet he's actually correct and that's a non, non enterprise engagement is completely nonpartisan, um, totally um, I, I just want to add one point because it kind of speaks to Peter when you get people aligned behind a purpose and everybody in the company is in sales everybody is when they go to parties and they talk about their companies, when they meet other people on the street and they talk about their companies, they're always talking about the power of their companies in the world. That's selling. The That's right. That's, yeah. Yep. Like Zappos is a great example. People that you know work for that company become passionate brand ambassadors. Hmm. So Barb, what is your, uh, you getting, you know, we're kind of working our way down from the macro to the micro. You've been in, you know, you're an expert really in incentive program design, rec in, you know, recognition program design. What are your key uh, advice to people that have budgets to spend money this way? Uh, hire a professional to help you design the program. There are incentive professionals and certified professionals of incentive management in the world that will help you do all the things that Solange and Peter and Al have talked about, aligning the individual's goals with the company goals. It's a great way, incentive reward and recognition programs are a great way to focus in all employees, not just sales employees, on what are those goals of the company? Uh, what are the behaviors that you value? Uh, Peter described some of the uh, process goals that are part part of a well-designed program, not just a result goal. And then um, also a professional can help you decide what are those right things to measure? How does it align with your engagement program? And then how do you measure the right things to really, I mean, find the financial people are going to be looking for the numerical ROI, you know, exactly what is, what is the result of that, the financial gain of that program. But the management or sales managers might be more interested in a real ROI that's going to take into account all of those other things that they discussed, whether the company's focused on innovation or collaboration or culture or whatever those other things are, they can all be measured. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Barb. And Peter, uh, from your perspective, sales, what is the advice that you would give to most companies who are spending all this money on these sales incentive programs with very little ROI. What are your recommendations? Well, well, one, I would say, let's make sure, like we've said before, let's reward the behaviors that's going to drive these better sales. It's great for the salespeople because they have a roadmap to know when they put their head on their pillow every night, how did I do? Am I leading towards that goal or not? Two, it actually gives the manager the ability to see on a dashboard, where is that salesperson lacking in their performance in those KPIs. If we're measuring those behaviors, where are they lacking? Two, whenever I talk to a vice president of sales, it's always, what do you want to do? I want to increase sales. Well, we all want to increase sales, but what really do we want to be, do? 
be strategic about it. Is it it's high margin products we want to increase? Is it a new product launch? Is it multiple categories that we may not be focused on? Be as specific as you can on what sales, what type of sales you want to increase. And then three, and everyone I think on this call has already said it, you have to measure this. You absolutely have to. If somebody's not answer, asking the question within the organization of how is this big budget really doing for us, they're going to eventually. So be prepared. So get that ROI after each, each quarter, each year, you should be prepared to be able to answer something like that. Well, great. Let me uh, do this. I'm going to go back uh, and do kind of a quick recap of this great advice. Uh, hopefully you folks see my screen there. Um, and essentially the big advice that we've gotten here that, uh, excuse me, while I do this, it's not cooperating. There we go. Uh, number one from Solange, as I said before, create a strategic human capital management plan, develop dashboards that score the information that's relevant to your business. Uh, earlier, I gave you some ideas uh, on top of that. Measure, measure, measure whatever activities related to those score, that dashboard that you come up with, and come up with dashboards that you can track to financial results. Uh, uh, the, from the point of view of Al, uh, as a quick recap, the, the a brand, a great brand is really a persona. It's a company, what it looks like on its best day. And when every employee, if every stakeholder, every shareholder has an idea of what that company looks like on the best day, then everybody's activities can be worked toward it. And that in turn will help the people like Barb and Peter who are designing in the practical incentive programs to A, to make sure that it, whatever type of incentive and recognition program you're doing, that it lines up to the organizational objectives. It lines up to the dashboard that uh, companies like Solange help their companies uh, develop. And by the way, you can now compare your dashboards with other companies. HC Moneyball actually enables you through a licensing. You can go and see what your own human capital ROI is against other companies. So you, there's no lack of data today, as other people here have said. Uh, so the whole idea then is to obviously don't just focus on the goals, focus on the actions which have done more of are going to yield the de desirable result. Focus on providing people the tools they need to succeed. Uh, so in, in sales, and this applies both to what Barb uh, and Peter said, train people for the things they need to know, encourage mentorships, encourage a culture of equity. Uh, that means watching your managers, et cetera, et cetera, and making sure they're effective, but aligning all of your activities. And this is where technology, and I'm, can, I'm going to wrap up with this, can really come into play. Solange said something at the beginning of her conclusion. Uh, the best measures are not what people say, it's what they do. And today there's employee engagement app technologies out there that enable you to put on one smartphone platform. You can lay a cable in effect into the hearts and minds of every employee through their simple smartphone, through these apps. You can have your training, communication, feedback, social recognition, uh, collaboration, innovation. And then you're getting, and then of course, behavioral, what, you know, you can have incentive and recognition, wellness programs on these apps. They already exist. And I believe that's going to be a marketplace as big as CRM, customer relationship management in the coming years, because then Solange, you get, you get qualitative and quantitative and you get behavioral data. And then you can correlate that to what people said and you can correlate it to turnover and, and willingness to recommend. So there's a world of opportunity to turn the 50% or so of our expenses on average that go to people into a clear profit center and that's the opportunity. So uh, I have to thank Solange uh, Sharas once again from HC Moneyball, uh, Barb Hendrickson uh, from uh, Visible Communications, a, a content marketing and communications company in the B2B space, Al Sini with the uh, BCAT uh, brand alignment process, uh, and Peter Goldberg, uh, incentive team uh, with his uh, sales engagement tools. And just to remind you that the Enterprise Engagement Alliance uh, has a free uh, information platform at enterpriseengagement.org. And we have the world's only learning program at theeea.org uh, that actually teaches how to manage uh, to a human capital scorecard and ROI of engagement. And uh, Solange, you are a contributor to that. Thank you very much. So folks, have yourselves a great weekend. And this will, show will be live on YouTube shortly and we'll be sharing it throughout the year. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.